Hello and welcome to this tutorial on OSPF. This is part three where we talk about the design of OSPF. Now when you run OSPF on your network you're doing it to optimize your network's performance and, and benefit from all of the features of OSPF. However if you don't implement it properly you can actually work against yourself and degrade the effectiveness of OSPF. And so we're not just talking about the actual configurations that you enter on a router. We're talking about your overall approach, how you structure OSPF and how you actually design it on your network. Okay, so this is particularly important to consider on larger networks when you have many routers running OSPF. So we're going to start off by looking at something called the OSPF area and we'll see how it's used to bring some structure to a network by using OSPF. And after that, we'll take a look at the different roles that routers can play once they're configured to run OSPF. Okay? To really appreciate why we need to organize OSPF, let's take a look at an example. Now in this small network, we have eight routers, a couple links, and let's say maybe 100 or 200 subnets. That means every router is going to have a link state database with all of the links in there all of the OSPF information about each of the routers on the network and then all of the different subnets on the network. Every time a change occurs, let's say this link dies, LSAs are going to be sent out and we know the process. The link state database is updated and then we rerun the Dijkstra algorithm in order to determine our new routes. So this isn't such a big deal. Um, if these routers are relatively current devices and their hardware is up to date, meaning they have a lot of memory and the CPUs are, are relatively strong and new, then we're in good shape and our, and our network really has nothing to worry about. But what if our network is significantly larger? What if this is our network? And by the way, this isn't a realistic network design. It's here just to give you an idea of the scope of a network and what problems can happen. So think about the LSDB on a router for this network. They have to know information on every single router on the network, every single link on the network, and then every single subnet that hangs off of these routers. We could be talking thousands of subnets, hundreds or even thousands of links, and hundreds, maybe even a thousand routers. So our link state database is now huge, and that introduces problems for OSPF, potentially. So first, we need a lot more memory in order to hold that link state database. Not only that, every time a change occurs, every router has to react to it. So if we have a, a change down here, even the router up here is going to go ahead and have their link state database updated, and then they're going to have to go ahead and rerun the Dijkstra algorithm seems like a lot of effort and this could be constantly going on since it's a big network a lot of changes could happen all the time so not only the memory requirements are big but think about the Dijkstra algorithm itself it has to be run on everything in the link state database so the larger the database the more time it's going to take in order to apply that algorithm to all of the information okay so the, these these problems are all pointing towards we could run out of resources on our routers if OSPF gets too big. And once that happens, OSPF is going to stop functioning and we're going to lose those good benefits that we get from running OSPF in the first place. And so this brings us to the need for having good design and structure when we implement OSPF. And so basically OSPF uses the concept of an area in order to help it scale in a large environment. Now routers are going to be segmented into these different groups and each group is called an area and each area is going to be identified by a number. So you can see here we have area 0, area 1, and area 2. And quite simply an area is just a group of routers that all have the same link state database information. So as before, when we didn't have areas, every router had the same link state database information. Well here, we're cutting up the network, and only routers within an area share the same link state database information with other routers in that area. That means routers in different areas can have different link state database information. Now that's not a problem because routers can still route to the rest of the network 
because instead of knowing all the details about all the different other areas, they just know what is called summary information. So router B can still route to a network off of router F because it has some summary information about getting to destinations outside of its area. Now the benefits to doing this are with these areas, since each router knows a smaller portion of the network, their link state database is going to be a lot smaller. So router A only knows about router A, B, and D. It doesn't have to know about C, E, F, G, and H. So we're using less memory to hold all of the link state database details because there are less of them. So this is like a modular approach to splitting up the network. The other benefit is now the Dijkstra algorithm is not going to take as long to run on each of the databases because quite simply they're a lot smaller now. So you're not going to run into any performance hits regarding your CPUs. Also a big benefit here is by using areas we can find network st instability to one particular area. So let's say the link between routers G and F fails. Router A and Router B, for instance, are not going to have to update their link state database and then reapply the Dijkstra algorithm because they're just working on summary information, less detailed information on how to get to that network. So they're in a way shielded from that, from that instability on the network. They don't have to worry about it, yet they can still route to it if they need to. Now of these three areas, area zero has special meaning. This is often called the backbone area, and area zero is the area to which all other areas must connect. So area one and area two have to have a connection to area zero. If we were to add a new area, it would somehow have to connect to area zero. This is the backbone. Now, these different areas have different names and different restrictions and it's a bit beyond the scope of this tutorial and the CCNA material you need to, you need to cover. But I'm just going to throw these out here so that you're at least you're familiar with them. You may hear something like a stub area, a totally stubby area, a not so stubby area. For now don't worry about them but just keep in mind there's a lot more to learn about these after you complete your CCNA studies. And so in order to make this work, the routers are going to have to take on different roles now that we've implemented areas. Some routers are going, going to be considered internal routers. And all that means is they are a router within a single area, not the backbone because that's a special area, but any other area. So router B, for instance, is an internal router. Router G, for instance, is an internal router. Now similar to internal routers are backbone routers and a backbone router is in one area only but it has to be area zero the backbone so router E for instance is a good candidate to be a backbone router other routers are called area border routers and you'll see the abbreviation ABR a router that spans more than one area is considered an area border router and usually that router is going to span area zero which is the backbone and a non-backbone area. So for instance, router D is a good candidate to be an area border router because it's in area zero and it's also in area one and in area two. Usually the area border routers are going to be a bit beefier than the other routers because they're going to have a lot more link state database information because they're spanning multiple areas. There's another type of role a router could play, and that's the Autonomous System Border Router, often abbreviated as ASBR. So let's say router C was also running some other routing protocols, and it interfaced with a different network. Well, a router that connects to routers that are not running OSPF, that would be considered an Autonomous System Border Router. And here, router C could be running multiple other routing protocols. Okay, so together, areas and roles that routers can play are the tools that we use in order to organize our network to really optimize OSPF. Okay, let's summarize what we covered. 
We now know that OSPF can run into resource problems on the routers if we don't organize. And that's by virtue of having a large link state database and then having to apply the Dijkstra algorithm to everything inside that database. So with OSPF, we use something called the area in order to help organize it. And once we do that, we can scale OSPF to effectively run in very large networks. The concept of the area basically means that we're limiting the exposure of a router in an area. This has the benefits of creating a smaller link state database on those routers, which means they can run the Dijkstra algorithm faster, which means OSPF performs better, and they're not as exposed to all of the instability that can happen everywhere on the network because they rely on summary information which is just basically less detailed LSAs in order to get to the rest of the network. Finally we talked a little bit about the different roles that routers can play in OSPF. There are internal, there are backbone routers, area border routers, and autonomous system border routers. All of these have different functions and they help us uh, implement these areas. So they, they work hand in hand with the areas in OSPF. Okay, so that is OSPF Part 3 Design. Be sure to check out the configuration tutorials for OSPF next. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching.